I'm sure you all know that Star Trek Deep Space Nine contains many references to queer life. There's the famous queer kiss between Jadzia Dax and a former lover, as well as the subversive queer relationship between Dr. Bashir, the station's medical officer, and Elam Garrick, the station's, ahem, uh -huh, tailor. Gene Roddenberry wasn't always given the space to explore queer relationships. Hell, he could barely feature interracial relationships without the series getting nearly cancelled. But he was always a fierce proponent of queer representation and believed that when television would allow them to, queer relationships would be featured much more prominently in Star Trek. This was hard to achieve, however, since television was never quite ready to accept queer relationships. There's the famous script for the episode Blood and Fire about the AIDS epidemic that never got produced, in which the crew of the Next Generation Enterprise would have encountered a ship infected with regulin bloodworms, and were encouraged to donate blood to save lives. After Gene Roddenberry's death, though, queer representation in Star Trek often had to be much more subversive than it had ever been before. Rick Berman, the executive producer who took charge of many aspects of Star Trek, often fought fiercely against queer representation in the show. In fact, he had fought fiercely against many of the progressive elements that made Star Trek what it was. The writers of the show were always trying to sneak queer representation into the shows, including a lovely queer relationship between Julian and Garrick throughout Deep Space Nine that was never officially recognized, but later confirmed by the two actors who portrayed them as being gay or bi. So far, I'm relaying a lot of the information available in a wonderful video by Matt Baum, so I'm going to transition to the main topic of this video demonization of homosexuality in the United States military and governments, and the parallels to it in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. In DS9, the character Dr. Julian Bashir, who I've already briefly spoken about as being a queer icon in the show, was illegally genetically modified as a child. And that's not revealed until he gets outed in Season 5, Episode 16, Dr. Bashir, I presume, when his parents accidentally reveal his genetic modification to Chief O'Brien and Louis Zimmerman, a genius holographic technician there to make a holographic medical program based on Julian. You may remember Zimmerman from Star Trek Voyager, where he played the EMH, and I will also kind of be touching on some queer aspects of that character in the future, but we'll see when those videos come out. Genetic modification in Star Trek is illegal, and Zimmerman feels the need to file a report. So Julian is distraught and outraged by this invasion of his privacy since it could threaten his Starfleet career and ostracize him from society. In a universe, this is a result of the 1990s eugenic wars in which genetically enhanced humans, including who you may know, Khan Singh, tried to take over and were eventually repelled by the Federation, leading to genetic modification being banned within the Federation. In the episode, Julian Bashir turns to his closest friend, Chief O'Brien, for support because he does not want to be kicked out of Starfleet, but is also worried that having this information revealed to O'Brien might affect their friendship. Luckily, O'Brien is very understanding and tries to comfort him by telling him he's not a bad person for being the way he is. This wasn't a choice he made. And he's certain that public perceptions of the genetically modified have changed since the policies excluding them from service had been instituted. Julian, though, fully prepared to resign his commission and accept a life outside of Starfleet, goes to Captain Sisko and comes out to him before a court tribunal. Fortunately, the court kind of reevaluates some of the earlier stances Starfleet has taken on genetic modification and allows Julian to continue to serve in Starfleet. But this isn't the end of Julian's trials with his genetic enhancement and the repercussions and suspicion it causes him from Starfleet going forward. In Season 6, Episode 18, Inquisition, the station is visited by Luther Sloan, a member of the Secretive Section 31, a spy agency technically run by Starfleet but with no supervision and no accountability. Luther has all officers confined to quarters until they can be interrogated as they suspect a member of the bridge crew is a Dominion agent. Because of Julian's genetic enhancement, Section 31 suspects him of being recruited by the Dominion while he was interred in a Dominion prison camp a few years prior. But you know, despite Julian having escaped that prison camp and in the process freeing the head of the Klingon state, Gowron, in the process, Section 31 is worried that he may have defected to the Dominion because they have more favorable opinions of genetic engineering than Starfleet does. 
Ultimately, Julian's allegiances are tested, but after proving to Section 31 beyond a shadow of doubt that he has not been compromised by this aspect of himself that he has no control over, he comes out having proven his loyalty to Starfleet, but with a really bad taste in his mouth about the methods Starfleet used, and they're prying into deeply personal aspects of his life. Some of the invasive ways in which they try to get him to confess is to put him in a holographic simulation where they show his closest friends being disgusted with this aspect of his personality and testing him with a holographic projection of Dominion agents trying to force him into their side. While not explicitly queer, I believe that this parallels much of queer life within the US military and governments, even today in some aspects. For example, during the Second World War, gay soldiers were targeted by the military and if found out would be issued what was known as a blue discharge, outing them from the military and leaving them with a permanent stigma, preventing them from finding jobs and developing social relationships. After the war in February of 1950, Senator Joseph McCarthy began what would be later known as the Red Scare, claiming that communists had infiltrated the United States government and started a campaign of trying to discover and oust any quote, disreputable influences on the U.S. government. And this included homosexuals, since this was founded on puritanical ideas about heterosexuality and the nuclear family. Homosexuality was seen as a perverse influence on American society and government. McCarthy and the then FBI director J. Edgar Hoover believed that homosexuals were more susceptible to blackmail and thus posed a national security threat. Rather than acknowledging the underlying conditions and the hardships that gay people faced on a daily basis, the government decided to ruin their lives and force them out of their jobs. This wasn't a light thing. If you were found out to be gay in the 1950s or 60s, you were functionally unemployable and were likely to be the victim of hate crimes and disownment from your family. In the very early 1950s, President Eisenhower signed an executive order which barred homosexuals from working in the federal government. This led to the firing of about 5,000 gay people from the federal government. It wasn't until the 1970s that a federal court ruled that people couldn't be fired from the government for being gay. But this didn't signal an end for exclusion homosexuals faced. There were still restrictions placed on how gay people could interact within the government and which jobs they could hold. In 1995, when Bill Clinton rescinded the executive order, even then it still wasn't perfect. He enacted Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which allowed gay people back into the military, but still didn't give them freedom to express who they were. And that bill didn't even get repealed until Barack Obama took office, and gay marriage in the United States wasn't even fully legalized until 2013. Star Trek has never shied away from their heavily progressive influences, even when threatened by networks or suppressed by the heads of the show. And I think that these episodes are a clear reference to the influence people Joseph McCarthy had on the 20th century United States government, some of which we still experience. Towards the later seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Rick Berman was seemingly pushing harder than ever to hide queer relationships from the series. Like I've already mentioned, Garrick had a rich history of queer attraction to Dr. Bashir, but he was forced into an awkward relationship with Zial, a half Bajoran, half Cardassian woman, who was only 20 years old, while Garrick would have had to have been in his 40s, or potentially even older. And so the writers had to be more and more subversive in their writing of queer and progressive characters. But I for one am glad that even in the face of such pushback, they had the courage to write about subjects that mattered, and try in whatever way they could to illustrate issues within our modern life.